All right, so guys, I was really, uh, the last lecture, we were really getting into a couple different things, okay? And we were talking about isolationism, appeasement, okay, and neutrality. That to keep us out of war, yes? Okay, isolationism keeps us out of war, yes? Appeasement is supposed to keep us out of war. But will it? Okay, so that's what we're looking at, all right? Uh, now, this slide really drives home the point of just how isolationist the American people were. Okay, so we're looking at, they wanted to push for an amendment that would require a popular vote. I finished this right at the end of the lecture the other day, okay? Huh? That would take so long. Oh, I know. How would you? Now, today with phones, and, I, you know, I don't know, guys, how you feel about this, but I feel like we need to do a better job with our elections. I think, now, I worry about if we use technology, that being hacked, and so forth, okay? And in Michigan, they had some problems with the machines, where in one county, the 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 head of the polling station figured it out, but it was a county that had always gone Republican and it switched to Biden. And she looked at some tabulations within the machine, within the software, and it was wrong. And it switched, I mean, like it was like a 3,000 vote switch. Okay, now there are 42 other counties in Michigan that use that, and other states have used that. I don't know if people were looking into that or if that's a problem. But anything like that starts to raise questions about the integrity of our elections. And um, now the fact that they're all based on states, the states set up their own election, okay? There's no federal, you know, that's part of the deal. The states get to set up their own elections. And, you know, Florida had all kinds of problems in 2000, and they fixed it. And they were one of the first states to, like, here it is. It's, we got it done. Okay, and that's a big state. Um, so I don't know. Um, I don't, what am I talking about? Uh, yeah, voting for uh, go to war. So yeah, I mean, I think with technology, you could try and do something like this, but still, most people are not informed. You know what I mean? They, they, most people can't even pick out places on a map, let alone tell you what the foreign policy issues are facing the country and the world on this, okay? So that's why we elect people to make these decisions for us, okay? So FDR opposed this. Congress said no. Okay? Now, in 1938, look at the date here. January of 1938, Roosevelt proposes a world conference to reduce arms, to promote economic security. Okay, it's 1938. Hitler has fully rearmed. He's remilitarized the, the DMZ. Okay, Italy's on the warpath. Japan's on the warpath. And Roosevelt says, let's come together and get rid of our weapons. What, what is he doing here? Okay. This is crazy. I mean, is he asking the British and the French to commit suicide by disarming while Hitler is poised to take over Europe? What is he doing? Guys, this is politics at home. He's talking to the American people here. The American people are very isolationist. He is feeding into that. Okay, if you remember, 1938 was a bad year for the Democrats. Remember this? The purge of the Democratic Party of conservative Democrats and the Roosevelt recession in 1937 going into 38. So he was having a rough time. The Supreme Court was hammering him. He talked about packing the court. That went down as a bad deal. So Roosevelt's just, I mean, this is a head scratcher, okay? But you got to know what's going on here. 
Now, the British Prime Minister at the time is a guy named Neville Chamberlain. Okay, let me introduce you to Neville Chamberlain. This is a very important figure in this history. Okay, Chamberlain will give a resounding no to Roosevelt's proposed conference, as will the rest of Europe. Okay, they're like, uh, thanks, but no thanks. We're not going to commit suicide here. Okay. All right. Moving on. Here we go. Hitler on the march. Okay. Now, this is an important thing to remember. Okay. Hitler's going to give a reason for why he wants to invade these other countries. And that reason is to unite German blood, to unite those people of German ethnic background. Okay. And those, remember, he's from Austria. Hitler's from Austria. Okay. These are Germanic people, some of them living in Austria, some of them living in Czechoslovakia, some of them living in Poland. So these are his next three targets, or his first three targets right here. Okay. In March of 1938, Hitler will amass his army at the border with Austria. Okay. Now, does Austria have an army? Yeah. They have a navy. Okay. Could they fight? Sure. Would they win? No. Okay. And this is where I got to kind of stop and explain something to you. I mentioned this in an earlier lecture. Guys, there's a Nazi party in all of these countries. We had one in the U.S. Okay. There's a Nazi party, party in Austria. Okay, some of you may have seen the movie, one of my wife's all-time favorites, The Sound of Music. The Sound of Music? That's your what? My mom's favorite. Your mom's favorite? You haven't seen The Sound of Music? <laughs> Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. It's a classic. Okay. Now, you remember the Von Trapp family. The dad is a what? Colonel? Is it Admiral? Admiral Von Trapp, isn't it? I think it's Admiral. He's an Admiral. Admiral's in the what? Navy. Okay. Now, Liesel, the oldest. I am 16. Seventeen. Yes? She's dating a young man. And he's infatuated with whom? The Nazis. Okay? The Nazis have infiltrated Austria long before this. Okay? And this, is a, this goes back to a, uh, Roman history. Okay? And it's something called the Fifth Column. right there, didn't I? Okay. The fifth column. Okay. The, remember the Romans, right? The Romans used to invade other countries, right? And take them over. And it just kept growing and growing and growing. Yes? Roman Empire. Okay. Now, how they would do that is by using the fifth column. This is a group of people that is are sent into a country ahead of time to build support for the Romans or in this case, the Nazis, in that country, okay? And they're also there to sow discontent. Okay, if you go back to the 2016 election, they talked about Russian interference, yes? Russian interference in our election. Remember this? I don't know how you didn't hear it, because they talked about it for freaking four years, okay? But anyhow, what were the Russians trying to do? They were trying to create division in this country. Like, we didn't have enough already. Okay, they're trying to sow discontent against the government to get people fighting each other. Okay, when you get people fighting each other and show discontent of the government, you weaken that government, make it ripe for takeover. Okay, so this fifth column was very effective, and let me explain. These are German troops marching across into the Austrian, across the Austrian border. Okay. You see this woman crying. 
Yes? Yes. Anguish? How about joy? These are tears of joy. The Nazis were met with flags, swastikas, waving Austrians, waving them, welcoming them into the country. The Nazis were seen as a savior. Now that's what the fifth column set up. Okay? There was no fire. Hitler will basically annex it. He will visit his hometown in Austria. There'll be a huge celebration. They will not have to fire one bullet. Okay? And I've got a little video. <clears throat> so we can watch this happen. How's that sound? It's like four minutes long. Okay. Hitler. Volume here. It was the 12th of March, 1938, and Hitler had finally emerged from his self-imposed inactivity. He crossed the border near his birthplace at Braunau. The people rejoiced at this first act of expansion, which they saw as the fulfillment of an old dream of the German nation, the Anschluss, an emphatic display of self-determination, a right denied to the German people under the Versailles Treaty, whose terms were generally considered unjust. Therefore, the foreign powers would not interfere. Visibly moved, he entered Vienna. And the city that had seen his early failures now gave him a hero's reception. Homage was being paid to the man who had achieved the unification of the German people. From the balcony of the Imperial Palace, he announced... Without the tacit approval of fascist Italy, the Anschluss would not have been possible. Benito Mussolini had sacrificed his old friendship with Austria for the sake of a new alliance with Adolf Hitler. And Hitler was grateful. Hitler had worked hard to win favor with Italy's dictator. Mussolini's distrust of the powerful northern state was overcome only when Hitler lent his support to the Duce's aggressive foreign policy. personal bond between the two was strengthened during visits to each other's country. Their political alliance became, in their emotive fascist terminology, the axis on which the destiny of the world would turn. Mussolini's visit to Germany in the autumn of 1937 ended with a nocturnal rally in the Olympic Stadium in Berlin. There was ambitious talk of world power. Mussolini declared his loyalty to Hitler for better or for worse. It was his virtual surrender to Hitler, the man he had despised. Unsere beiden großen Völker, ihr Menschen, die gewaltige und wachsende Masse von 115 Millionen betragen, zusammen stehen. Floods of rain, floods of emotion, and clever choreography was the ironic verdict of Canciano, the Italian foreign minister.
Hitler's propaganda experts preferred to hold their ceremonies at night. Time and again, they organized torchlight processions to lend the proceedings a demoniac glow. The fascist cult of fire is an omen of the fire that was to consume the world. Okay, so that gives you a little bit of insight there, uh, just about how they went into Austria and then that relationship between Mussolini and Hitler, okay? Um, now, when you say annex, that means to basically envelop and make part of your country, okay? Um, which is a little bit different than what goes on later on, okay? Good. Any questions on that there? Um, okay. Now, so you have two things here. Uniting German blood is an excuse. And then the other is, you know, avenging the Treaty of Versailles and the punishments that were put on Germany, okay? All right, so next he's going to turn his attention to Czechoslovakia, okay? Now, I'm going, to, I'm going to back up for a minute and go back to this map here, okay? Remember this, this region right here called the Sudetenland, all right? This is important to uh, Hitler. It is here, which are a defensive barrier uh, against Germany that the Czechs have, okay? And it's a very piece, important piece of real estate. But there are about 3 million people of German ancestry living in the Sudetenland, okay? So, the Czech, the Czech government is really the only democratic republic uh, east of the Rhine River, okay, at this point in time. Uh, but I talked about the 3 million people of German ancestry here. Now, the Czechs, uh, they're willing to fight, okay? Now, because of the Alps being in the way of the German army, okay, it, they do have a fighting chance here, all right, but they would like to have some allies with them. You know, people that are going to maybe help them. And the obvious countries are Britain and, yes, Russia, okay? Now, I, I got to go back and talk a little bit about Russia, okay, or at this time, the Soviet Union, all right? And this is something that um, I've brought up before. Okay. We talked about on the world map here, okay? Czechoslovakia is here, okay? And if the Germans take Czechoslovakia, it's, it's almost a gateway into this region of the southeastern part of Europe, okay, called the Baltic. Okay, um, or uh, yeah, the Balkans down in here. Okay, this this area. Remember, Russia doesn't have a warm water port. Okay, so anytime something happens down here in Southeast Europe, it's going to raise the ire of the Russians. Okay, and so the Russians we know have already been helping in Spain, right, against the fascists there. So the Czechs are hoping somebody's going to come help them. Does that make sense? All right. So they're willing to fight. But, guys, that call will not be answered. Okay. Now, the British and the French are going to get involved here, but just not the way the Czechs want or hope for. This is Neville Chamberlain, Okay. This is the British Prime Minister. He's going to meet with Hitler over this issue of the Sudetenland, okay? It's going to be four men in the room, okay? Neville Chamberlain, Premier Dallivier of France, okay? This is the French leader, Dallivier, okay? Here, they're going to meet with Hitler and Mussolini. Where are they going to meet? They're going to meet in Munich in September of 1938. Okay. Now, when I was in Munich, I went and looked for this place where they met, okay, because I wanted to take a picture of it so I could put it in my slideshow, okay. Well, that didn't work out. 
I found it on a map. You know, you have all these tourist maps, you know what I mean? And so I find it. Okay, it's like this really little thing. So my wife and I walk like, I don't know, a mile to get to this place. Big flight of stairs, there's two big doors, you know, like that are, I don't know, 15 feet high. Okay. So I go up this flight of stairs, and there's nobody around. I'll just see what's in there. So I open the door. Okay. And I'm wearing, guys, this is 1999. I'm a tourist. Okay. I'm in Germany. I'm wearing an Ohio State Buckeye t shirt. Okay. Uh, high top tennis shoes, cargo shorts, you know, the typical American tourist, right? And so I open this door, and there's like a black wall there, and you can go right or left. So I just kind of peek around to the left, walk around, and there's all these people dressed in tuxedos and evening gowns, and they've got these busts of statues all around, and they're drinking champagne. And I look in there, and I'm like, oops, <laughs> and got the hell out of there. I don't know. I don't know what it was, but uh, it was. Yeah, it wasn't a tourist spot, okay? But that was pretty embarrassing. But nobody knew who I was, so. Just another embarrassing American tourist. Okay. Sorry, maybe that wasn't a good story to tell. I tried to find it. Now, this meeting is going to become known as the Munich Pact, okay? And this is significant, okay? Because instead of helping Czechoslovakia, and by the way, I said these four men are in the room. Who's not in the room? The Czech president is not in the room. And they're talking about Czechoslovakia. He's in the hallway. Literally weeping. He's weeping. Because he knows what's going on inside that room. They're making a deal, okay? And they're going to carve up Czechoslovakia. So by attempting to what? Appease Hitler. They are going to dismember Czechoslovakia and hand the Sudetenland to Hitler. Chamberlain. Returns to London. He gets off the airplane. He's on the tarmac. And he holds up this piece of paper. Okay? He says this. He says, this paper bears my name, as well as the signature of Herr Hitler, that he will seek no new territorial gains in Europe. We have peace in our time. And the crowd erupts in applause. And the newspapers all over Europe the next day, big bold letters, peace in our time. Now that the Alps are out of the way, and Hitler brings his troops into the Sudetenland, do the Czechs have any shot? How long will it be till Hitler takes the rest of Czechoslovakia? Well, I'll tell you. Six months. We have peace in our time. For six months. Now, we didn't know this at the time. But if the French and the British would have resisted Hitler here, and actually taking the side of Czechoslovakia, that there were German generals planning to remove Hitler. But instead they appeased him, and Hitler is riding high. Now he's taken over two countries, okay, when this is exposed as a failure, and the Czechs will not fight. So in March, which is basically six months later, they will take the rest of Czech. So Hitler's taken two countries without firing a shot. This is probably the single greatest example of appeasement. Now, historians can argue this both ways. One, the British were not ready for war. The French were not ready for war. Okay. 
But if you remember that video I talked about, or that I showed the other day about just the guy that was sitting there talking, he talked a little bit about dealing with China and Iran today and dealing with, you know, somebody before they become too powerful. Okay. Hitler was powerful at this point, but he was not fully ready for war. Okay. Now's the time to stand up to it. Okay. But some people say, well, this gave time for the British and the French to prepare for war. It gave them a little more time. Okay. Well, guys, yeah. Now, with this, during this time period, Hitler will increase the persecution of the Jews. Okay. Now, I'm going to do a couple of days on the Holocaust um, when we finish World War II. Okay. So instead of like kind of throwing a little bit in here at a time, I'll just cover the whole timeline of the Holocaust when it's when we're done here. Okay. All right. So Chamberlain, um, his days are numbered as British Prime Minister. Okay. Not, not yet, but soon. We good here? Okay. All right. So this is a pretty good map, guys. Um, that shows how things happened here. Okay, so this is your Sudetenland here, okay, September 30th, 1938. Okay, Czech territory given to Hungary by Germany just a couple days later in October of 38 will be this region down here. Okay. Now what Hitler is doing is he's he's doing two things. Um, he's about to start signing non-aggression pacts with countries, saying, I promise not to attack you non-aggression back with each other. Okay, if you don't attack me, I won't attack you. And he's trying to build some relationships here with Hungary. Okay. These places are all in his sights. Okay. Uh, this part will be given to Poland uh, or annexed by Poland November 1st, 1939. Now this is probably more of a defensive move on the part of Poland. Okay. Because the Poles are going to fight. They're not, not going to peace. They're going to fight. Okay. So uh, Hitler always said that he needed living space, Lebensraum, in the east. Poland lies to Germany's east. Okay. As this, the Czech. Now, I have some political cartoons here. And on this platform, the most marvelous more amazing marvel of the age. He lives, he talks, yet he has no, no guts. <laughs> and yes, this is Dr. Seuss. Okay. Dr. Seuss did a lot of political cartoons during the war. Right. This is kind of a modern day um, appeasement. So the bone is appeasement. The dog is terrorism. Good boy, see, I give nice dog a bone and he goes away. Okay? Yeah, is that supposed to be? Uh, yeah, I don't know if that's actually a person or not. Oh. You know, if it, who's it's representing, I'm not sure. If you gave me a date, I might be able to tell you. Here's another Dr. Seuss. Play a nice song for the creepy Nazi octopus monster, and maybe he'll be nice to you. Uh, I threw this in here, um, just kind of, it's kind of a jab at our media today. Okay, so U.S. overreacts, nukes Japan, President ignores pleas for proportional response to Pearl Harbor war. Okay. And then here, uh, CNN reporter on the beaches of Normandy, which we're not there yet, but we will be soon. By invading here in Normandy, the Allies are collectively punishing the French for the Nazi occupation of their country. So we're the bad guy. All right. Continuing. Italy now. It's her turn again. So Hitler's got Czechoslovakia and, and Austria. Well, Italy's going to invade Albania. Any idea where Albania is? 
in southeastern Europe, okay? So you guys know Italy, the, the heel of Italy here, the toe of Italy. Right across the uh, Adriatic Sea is Albania, okay? And that'll be uh, April 7th, 1939, okay? Now, Neville Chamberlain and the British step up and say, all right, look, if Greece, which is right here next to Albania, Poland up here, and Romania, which is over here, maybe here, okay? Uh, if any of these nations are attacked, Great Britain will go to war, okay? And they will keep that promise, okay? And the French will join. Now, here comes FDR rolling in again from across the pond. <laughs> He's going to send a letter to Hitler. And it's basically a request asking Hitler not to attack these countries. And he gives him a list of 31 countries. And asks him not to attack these countries for 10 years. What is the President of the United States doing? Now, certainly, he knows the American people don't want us to get involved, right? So, I don't know what he's doing. Trying to, like, delay the Germans. He's not saying, hey, if you attack any of these 31 nations, we're going to war with you. He's not saying that. This is a request. Okay. So Hitler reads this letter in front of the German Reichstag, which is all Nazis. Okay, and he's holding this up and he's reading, he's saying, he's like, we want no Poles, we want no Swedes, we want no Danes. You know, he's going through this and they're laughing at the states. Now this really pisses FDR off. Okay, but what's he going to do? Declare war? No. So he asked Congress to repeal the arms embargo. Remember, at this point, you can buy American guns, but not our bullets. Buy our planes, but not our bombs. You with me? Remember that? Okay, so this would repeal the arms embargo, allowing us to send the bullets and the bombs. And Congress says no. Okay. Because they want to get reelected too. That's the German Reichstag. I guess it's kind of got a dome. Some spare, some, I don't know what you call these things. Spears. Any architectural treatment in it? Spires. Spires. Thank you. All right, hey, time to check in with Japan. Okay, so, continuing problems with Japan. The U.S. is going to end its commercial treaty with Japan. Uh, these are words. These are words. These are not actions. Now, this did free Congress to stop the sale of war materials to Japan. When we're talking about war materials here. We're talking about oil. We're talking about steel. Okay? We're talking about rubber you need for your vehicle, okay? These sorts of things that can be used by the Japanese that we're trading with them, and they're using that to build their military and attack China. So we don't cut off Japan yet, but by law, we are able to cut them off when we're ready to cut them off. It's going to be a while. Now, I know when I talk about just how isolationist and how the President of the United States is, in, in a way, appeasing Hitler and, and, and doing this stuff, guys, it just sounds not like America, doesn't it? The America that you grew up in. It's not, I mean, today it's totally different, right? We tend to stick our nose into things. We get involved. 
Okay, and one of that's one of the reasons for that is the lessons that we learned during this time period. Okay, to let things get out of hand, we we tend to stick things first before they get out of hand. Are you with me? If we don't learn from history, guys, we're in trouble. Man, time goes too fast in here. We're just getting this thing rolling. All right, here we go. You ready? Oh, I got one more. Don't worry about that. It's on the next slide. Okay. I just mentioned these non-aggression factors, okay? Hitler is going to sign a non-aggression pact. Are you listening? With every single country he invaded. He will have a non-aggression pact with them. Okay. What does this teach us about history? Don't trust dictators. Right? They don't keep their word. They don't answer to anybody. Now, when he signs the non-aggression pact with the Russians, with the communists, people are scratching their head in Germany like, why is Hitler doing this? We hate the freaking communists. Okay? Because that's what Hitler's been telling them. So why are they doing this pact? Okay? Now, what the world is told about this and what the reality of this pact is are two different things. The world is told that these two powers have agreed not to attack each other, and that's it. The secret part of the pact is that Poland, that poor country that sits in between those two countries, is about to be in trouble on both fronts. They're going to divide it up between them. Okay, so Germany's going to get Western Poland, and the Soviets, they're going to get more than just Eastern Poland. They're going to get the okay from Hitler to invade Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania up along the coast of the Baltic Sea up there. You guys know where these countries are? Oh, that's going to go away from me, Chris. Stay. Stay. Over here. Ooh. Okay. Up here. Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. Right here. Okay. This is the Baltic Sea. Okay. These three countries. Okay. Any of you guys uh, been there? You what? No? Okay, I haven't either. I'd like to go. Uh, now, guys, the Russians are going to invade there, and they're going to hold that until 1990, those countries, Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. Now, pay attention in the next video, guys. I'm going to tell a story about a city, a town in Poland, when we divide up Poland, okay? Sorry, I wish we had more time together. Ooh.